Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great GM. Well, today's episode, we're taking it all the way back. This is not GM 101, this is GM 000. In other words, how do you run your first game? And we're taking it, like I said, all the way back to the very beginning, the very foundation. Now, there are eight steps, in my opinion, as to how you should run your first game. The most important step, of course, which is not one of the eight, is that you have to decide that you're going to run a game in the first place. And if you can do that, well, you're in a much better situation than anyone else who's never run a game. So you decide you're going to try your hand at this crazy idea of game mastering. How do you do it? Well, step one, as always, is you decide what you want to do. Do you want to do a swashbuckling 1758 pirates type of uh, game? Do you want to do a science fiction game? Do you want to do a high fantasy game? Do you want to do a grungy game? Do you want to do a modern game? Do you want to do a high school game? Do you, uh, you choose what interests you to run and what you think that you might be able to do quite well. So if you're going to run a Star Wars game and you've never watched Star Wars, I would suggest against it if it's your first game. For your first game, try and choose some setting, some era, some epoch that you are familiar with. So if you are a fan of Greek history, well, use a fantasy setting in a Greek Hellenistic type space. Why don't you make use of what you know? And that's going to make it so much easier. So step one, choose your setting, choose your space, choose your game according to what you know already, not that you're going to have to go and research. Now there's a reason for that, is that if you choose a space that you know, that you're familiar with, so you choose Harry Potter World or you choose Lord of the Rings as a setting, for example, because you know the second name of Mithrandir and all those kind of wonderful things. If you have that as a repository in your head, as you play the campaign, as your game continues to run forward into many, many, many sessions, your ability to make up things on the fly that are consistent within that space remains good because you're familiar with it. So you can just work out what little town is south of Brie, etc., etc. So if you've got a good working knowledge of the space you're going to be playing in, it gives you a much greater advantage than if you are unfamiliar with the space that you're in because making things up becomes that much more tricky. So step one, choose your space. Step two. Now this is a step that I think a lot of people miss Step two is you then go to your player base. If you've got four friends or three friends or five friends or 50 friends or however many it happens to be who want to play in your game, they want to be there for your very first inaugural GM game, ask them what type of game they'd like to play. Now this video is dedicated to this and I'm, I'm skimming over the top. If you want more elaborate information, go and look at the videos and things where you look at how to do all sorts of things. But this is just the highlight. So you ask them what type of game they want and then you look at whether that fits with what you want to do or not. So if you want to do a pirate game and they're all saying, oh well, yeah, but we'd rather play a, a science fiction game. Well, that's not too far off of the mark. Science fiction games means they're on a starship as opposed to a sailing ship. They're flying around space, terrorizing space, air, space liners, not space cargo liners, space cargo ships even. They're pirates and they're tracking and they're being chased by the law. Or they are the law tracking down space pirates. So it's about aligning your desire plus the desire of your players to make sure that they're getting what they're hoping for. And you'll see there's a video on expectations which allows you to really play to what they're looking for. Don't just go to them though before you've chosen your city and say, so what do you want to play? Most or some will say, oh, I don't mind, whatever you feel like. If you don't have a plan already, if you don't have some sort of setting, you're wasting your time. Rather go to them and say, what would you like to play? Oh, you want to play that, that and that? I'd like to play this. And this is why I'd like to play it. If they're interested, if you sell the space to them, they might say, well, cool, let's do that. Let's explore what you're, you're doing. Let's go and have a look at it and let's play. That's the bottom line. So speak to them, see what they want, and then send them on the mirror to create characters whilst you now move on to doing the actual creation of the adventure. 
So step three is now where you actually create the adventure. So now we've worked out where it's gonna be set, we've worked out what our players are looking for, now we need to work it out exactly how it's going to unfold. Now from my own personal experience, let me tell you that you are going to overcomplicate and get analysis paralysis, I love saying that, because you're going to try and create this epic Lord of the Rings adventure for Adventure 1 straight off the bat. You want to impress, you want to bring to the table this dearth of knowledge that you have and this adventure that you've plotted out that will make J.R. Martin cringe, or George, not J, J.R. Tolkien. Anyway, George Martin cringe as well as J.K. Rowling. And interesting, all of them have got these funny initials. I should start calling myself G.S. Glanders from now on. We'll do it that way. Anyway, so <laughs> I segue. So the idea is to keep it simple. Now there's a wonderful little acronym called KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple so that even a stupid person could follow it. Or don't try and show off stupid, keep it simple. However you want to phrase that. And I myself have frequently made the mistake where I've created these very convoluted episodes or adventures where there's so much going on and the players don't even know what the actual adventure is because it's just so, so, so compounded and interwoven. Keep it simple. It's your first adventure. The objective here is for you to tell a good story and entertain your players whilst doing so and use their stories to make your story better. That's the entire goal. So keep it simple. And the way that we keep it simple is you first think about the story. You think about a start, a middle and an end. And there are other videos, the 121 and the 122 method, which you can go and have a look at. But suffice it to say, you need a starting point. Where are your characters going to start? You're going to have a middle point, what's going to happen in the bulk of the adventure, and then you're going to have an end point, how does the adventure end? Now, all of those steps will change as the players do various things. Your job is to bring them back to those points, or to make sure that those points move to wherever the players have gone, so that they can encounter them and work through them as per your plan. So, with a start, work out where they start. Try and make it as exciting, as interesting as possible. Where in the middle, once they've worked out that they've got to solve this murder mystery or they've got to go and find out where the Hobbit's princess has been taken to, then you go off and you look at the middle section where you work out, okay, there's a castle, they've got to break into the castle and then rescue the princess. And then the ending, of course, is the showdown where the princess is tied up in a tower and the evil lord is protecting her and the players have to defeat the evil lord. It's a very simple progression. The players get hired to go and rescue the princess. They go to where the princess is. They rescue the princess. Everyone's happy. Very, very, very simple. That's the story. Keep it simple. Then you look at maps. What maps do I need? Now, if you're not good at drawing maps on the fly, I suggest you prep them beforehand. So in our example, where we have our heroes going off to save a princess from a dastardly duke who's kidnapped her, we would need a map, perhaps, of the town that they start in, the little tavern that they're starting in, if you're starting them there. Wherever you might start them, you would need a map for. Then you'll need a map of the castle, because they're going to try and get into that castle. So draw a map of the castle. And if you're not very good at drawing, there are thousands of resources out there, including my own, as a matter of fact, where you can get maps of castles and the like for you to then download. Finally, of course, uh, do we need a map of the room in which the Duke is going to hold the princess? Well, if you like to plan heavy detail, then yes, maybe. But the map of the castle might be sufficient. So work out your maps that you require. Then you need to work out the NPCs that are involved. Is the tavern keeper the one who's going to give them the information about the princess? Or is it perhaps the king of the halflings who's going to request the aid of our heroes to go and rescue his daughter? So you work out who your NPCs are, your non-player characters, the characters that you as the GM will be playing. Work out one for the start, work out a few for the middle, and then work out the one for the end, the dastardly duke who has taken the princess. What type of character is he? And you make notes on that in terms of what he's like, uh, what he, his ambition is, why did he capture the princess in the first place? That's a good question to ask. Maybe he's madly in love with her and just wants to marry her, in which case now there's a time pressure, but the players have to get there before he manages to finish the ceremony. Whatever you like. So by working out your NPCs, you then have their names, you have what they're going to be doing within the um, 
adventure? Are they going to be giving the quest? Are they going to be helping? Are they going to be supporting? Maybe you decide that in the middle when they journey to the castle, there's a haunted wood that they have to pass through first. In which case, maybe there's an old crone who will, if they are kind to her, and help her across the raging stream with her bundle of wood. Maybe she will then give them a secret passage that leads directly to the kitchens of the castle. As opposed to whether they don't help her, in which case she puts a curse on them and they get lost in the forest and have to face off against some giant bears. Which leads me to the next point that you're going to be looking at. This is still now point number three in terms of designing your overall adventure. So this is all the meat and bones, if you like, the actual designing of the adventure. So the next point is you then look at your encounters. Now this is a question that gets asked often. How many encounters should I have? How many battles should I have? And all the rule books have got different numbers. Some of them say, oh, you should have about eight a day. Others say, oh, you should have one a day. Well, it's entirely up to you. I, however, for your first adventure, would recommend that you have one encounter in the first, in the start, two encounters in the middle, and one encounter at the end. This is your first adventure. You don't need to recreate the Battle of Dunkirk or the Retreat of Dunkirk or the Battle of the Somme in order to have a great adventure. Just have a few encounters so that everyone is used to the mechanics and how combat rolls out. And also remember, encounters don't necessarily mean combat. So the first encounter in the tavern where the king of the halflings is hiring the party, maybe you want to have a bar fight break out. Maybe that's how the adventure starts, is in the middle of a bar fight. And the players get to punch around a few drunks and uh, have a little bit of fun doing so. That's your first encounter. That's the only encounter for the start. Once the players have decided to take up the quest and have headed off in the direction of the castle, assuming that they do so, of course, then you are into the middle of your story, and now you can have two encounters. So perhaps the first one is to set the tone, and that is in our haunted forest where they are attacked by wolves or bears, um, or treants perhaps, or pixies, or leprechauns who are upset because their gold coins are missing. You choose what it could be. Once they've had that encounter, then they get to the castle. The castle undoubtedly will be defended by something. Is it undead warriors raised by the dastardly duke? Is it ogres named Toadwort? who have to protect the castle whilst the duke arranges his marriage. That is your second encounter. Once they've got through that, they are now inside the castle, and you shouldn't have too many more encounters, uh, simply because, well, it takes time to run through encounters, and of course, if you just wanted encounters, you don't need the story. Then in the end, you need to have your final encounter. This must be the encounter with the duke. This is the one that you should pay particular attention to. How the battle plays out, where it plays out, and how to make it as interesting as possible for the players. Now, how do we know how to do that? Well, we're going to come to that in a little bit in another step that we will use to adjust all of these values. But now we've worked out our four encounters, we've worked out our general story structure, and we've worked out the maps that are needed for that. Please note, at no point have I indicated yet that you should turn to the rules or the statistics of your counters or your monsters or your villain or your heroes or your NPCs. None of that is important until you get to step five. Step four, by the way, was encounters, working out how many encounters you should have. I may have skipped that number. Anyway, step five. Now, step five is where you take your story, you take your NPCs, you take your encounters, and now you apply the rule system that you've chosen to run to them. Now you say, okay, fine, I have a wolf, let me go to the monster's manual or the alien encyclopedia or the dungeon dictionary or whatever the system is, and you open it up and you look at those creatures and you go, all right, well, they're quite powerful. So I can have three of those and I can have four of these and half a dozen of these and such and carry on like that. Stat out your NPCs that you specifically need. Don't do it for every single one. And of course, if you've got traps and things in the castle, you can do that too. Traps, by the way, count as an encounter. So perhaps you want to have a small little encounter in the forest or none whatsoever, just make it spooky and then have it a trap instead of the, uh, the wolves and bears and things. It's entirely up to you, but I digress. So now you link the whole thing to your system. Now you are ready. No, you're not. Because we are trying to be great GMs, not just GMs. A GM would stop there. They have their adventure, they have their statistics, they have their maps, they have their players, now they can go and play. For me, the step that's missing is now that you've got everything ready, 
Now you go back to your players. You go back to your players and you find out what characters they're playing. What have they decided to do? Now there should be a whole lot of dialogue backwards and forwards between you and your players anyway. But this for me is a step that most GMs miss is you go back to them and you say, tell me your backstory. What's your character afraid of? What's your character's goal? What's their ambition? And you take that information. You go, oh, I quite like the fact that the character is terrified of running water. I think that's interesting. Now you go back to the map of the woods that you've got or the castle and you insert a giant raging river with a broken bridge across it. Why? Because it's going to make it more interesting for the players and it's going to make the players feel as if there was something built there just for them. Maybe it's not as obvious as that. Maybe players have a goal to see true love flourish. Now you insert a prince, someone who is betrothed to the princess, who is going to come with them and help fight against all of the evil to save his beloved princess. Now suddenly that player has something that seems to resonate with them. It seems to be something that they can truly get behind. So that's a very good idea is to now go back to your players, find out what they want. Step seven is to then adjust your story, make it fit, make it work with what the players are after. And then step eight, only after you have done all of that, Step eight is when then you actually launch the game. Don't rush it, but don't go too slowly. Set up your scenes according to the steps that you've gone through, your start, your middle, and your end. Run it out as best as you can. And hopefully, if you're using that kind of timing, that kind of method, and you've got four encounters in total, it should take you about four hours to run your very first game. And that is as simple as that. Now, all of the other things, the nuances as to how to create interesting encounters, how to create interesting NPCs, how to draw maps on the fly, all of that stuff is in the channel, and you can go and find those videos when you are ready for it. But don't get stuck going, well, oh, I've got to, I've got to learn all this stuff before. No, 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 no. Follow the steps in this video, run your first game, and then learn. Then learn. Ask your players for feedback. Did it move fast enough? Were the counters interesting? Were the NPCs interesting? Did you have fun? Do you want to do another one? Shall we look at the next one? And the next one is going to be just as simple. You don't need to complicate things until you are completely comfortable with the idea of running bigger, more intertwined stories. And you can intertwine stories. You can glue them together later on. You don't have to start with a complete knowledge of your space. That's something that people get confused. They go, oh, I've got a map, I've got a map. I've got to fill the whole map with everything so that I know everything. No, you don't. Just start with this simple little step, this little process, and you'll be absolutely A-OK. -okay. Well, until next time, I wish you and yours the happiest of gaming.